Hey, it's Poetry Friday again, and this week I've been snowed in all week long, which is pretty fantastic. Uh, lots of ice, lots of snow outside, and so today I thought I would read Snowbound, A Winter Idyll by John Greenleaf Whittier. Now I'm not going to talk about it too much because uh, it's kind of a long poem, so it'll take me a little while to get through, but Whittier is one of the fireside poets. They're early romantic poets. If you'd like to know more about romanticism, you can click over here and watch my romanticism video, or over here, which talks about how romanticism works in America. Make sure you notice in this poem the way he uses nostalgia. He talks about being snowed in and uses that image to reflect on his past, his childhood, and the love that he has for his family. Being snowed in is a great time to enjoy your family. And years and years from now, you're going to think back on this moment with fond memories. So enjoy it now. The poem is a description of him and his family being snowed in, as we are this week. The sun that brief December day rose cheerless over hills of gray, and darkly circled, gave at noon a sadder light than waning moon. Slow tracing down the thickening sky its mute and ominous prophecy, a portent seeming less than threat, it sank from sight before it set. A chill no coat, however stout, of homespun stuff could quite shut out. A hard, dull bitterness of cold that checked, mid-vein, the circling race of lifeblood in the sharpened face, the coming of the snowstorm told. The wind blew east. We heard the roar of ocean on his wintry shore, and felt the strong pulse throbbing there, beat with low rhythm our inland air. Meanwhile, we did our nightly chores, brought in the wood from out of doors, littered the stalls and from the mows, raked down the herd grass for the cows, heard the horses whinnying for his corn, and sharply clashing horn on horn, impatient down the stanchion rows, the cattle shake their walnut boughs, while peering from his early perch upon the scaffold's pole of birch, the cock his crested helm bent, and down his careless challenge sent. Unwarmed by any sunset light, the gray day darkened into night, a night made hoary with the swarm of whirl dance of the blinding storm. As zigzag wavering to and fro, crossed and recrossed the winged snow, and ere the early bedtime came, the white drift piled the window frame, and through the glass the clothesline post looked in like tall and sheeted ghosts. So all night long the storm roared on, the morning broke without a sun, a tiny spherule traced with lines of nature's geometric signs, in starry flake and pellicle, all day the hoary meteor fell. And when the second morning shone, we looked upon a world unknown, on nothing we could call our own. Around the glistening wonder bent the blue walls of the firmament, no cloud above, no earth below, a universe of sky and snow. The old familiar sights of ours took marvelous shapes, strange domes and towers, rose up where sty or corn crib stood, or garden wall or belt of wood. A smooth white mound the brush pile showed, a fenceless drift that once was road. The bridal post, an old man sat with loose-flung coat and high-cocked hat. The well curb had a Chinese roof, and even the long sweep high aloof in his slant splendor seemed to tell of Pisa's leaning miracle. A prompt, decisive man, no breath our father wasted. Boys, a path! Well pleased, for when did farmer boy count such a summons less than joy? Our buskins on our, our feet we drew, with mittened hands and caps drawn low to guard our necks and ears from snow, we cut the solid whiteness through, and where the drift was deepest made, a tunnel walled and overlaid with dazzling crystal. We had read of rare Aladdin's wondrous cave, and to our own his name we gave, with many a wish if the luck were ours to test his lamp's supernal powers. We reached the barn with merry din, and roused the prison brutes within. The old horse thrust his long head out, and grave with wonder gazed about, the cock his lusty greeting said, and forth his speckled harem led. The oxen lashed their tails and hooked. A mild reproach of hunger looked. The horned patriarch of the sheep, like Egypt's Ammon, rose from sleep, shook his sage head with gesture mute, and emphasized with stamp of foot. All day the gusty north wind bore the loosening drift its breath before. Low circling round its southern zone, the sun through dazzling snow mist shone, no bell the hush of silence broke, no neighboring chimneys social smoke curled over woods of snow-hung oak. A solitude made more intense by dreary-voiced elements, 
the shrieking of the mindless wind, the moaning tree bough swaying blind, and on the glass the unmeaning beat of ghostly fingertips of sleet. Beyond the circle of our hearth, no welcome sound of toil or mirth unbound the spell, and testified of human life and thought outside. We minded that the sharpest ear the buried brooklet could not hear, the music of whose liquid lip had been to us companionship, and in our lonely life had grown to have an almost human tone. As night drew on, and from the crest of wooded knolls that ridged the west, the sun, a snow-blown traveler, sank from sight beneath the smothering bank. We piled with care our nightly stack of wood against the chimney back, the oaken log, green, huge, and thick, and on its top the stout back stick, the knotty forestick laid apart, and filled between the curious art the ragged brush. Then hovering near we watched the first red blaze appear, heard the sharp crackle caught the gleam on whitewashed wall and sagging beam, until the old rude furnished room burst flower-like into rosy bloom. While radiant with mimic flame outside the sparkling drift became, and through the bare-bowed lilac tree, our own warm hearth seemed blazing free. The crane in pendant trammels showed, the Turk's head on the andirons glowed, while childish fancy, prompt to tell the meaning of the miracle, whispered the old rhyme, Under the tree, when fire outdoors burns merrily, there the witches are making tea. The moon above the eastern wood shone at its full, the hill range stood, transfigured in the silver flood, its blown snows flashing cold and keen, dead white, save where the sharp ravine took shadow, or the somber green of hemlocks turned a pitchy black against the whiteness at their back. For such a world and such a night, most fitting that unwarming light, which only seemed where'er it fell, to make the coldness visible. Shut in from all the world without, we sat the clean-winged hearth about, content to let the north wind roar in baffled rage at pain and door, while the red logs before us beat the frost line back with tropic heat. And never, when a louder blast shook beam and rafter as it passed, the merrier up its roaring draught, the great throat of the chimney laughed. The house dog on its paws outspread laid to the fire his drowsy head. The cat's dark silhouette on the wall, the couchant tiger seemed to fall. And for the winter's fireside meet, between the andirons' straddling feet, the mug of cider simmered slow, the apples sputtered on a row, and close at hand the basket stood with nuts from brown October's wood. What matter how the night behaved, what matter how the north wind raved, blow high, blow low, not all its snow could quench our hearthfire's ruddy glow. O oh, time and change, with hair as gray as was my sire's that winter day, how strange it seems, with so much gone of life and love to still live on. Ah, brother, only I and thou are left of all that circle now, the dear home faces whereupon that fitful firelight paled and shone. Henceforward, listen as we will, the voices of that hearth are still. Look where we may, the wide earth o'er, those lighted faces smile no more. We tread the paths their feet have worn, we sit beneath the orchard trees, we hear like them the hum of bees, the rustle of the bladed corn. We turn the pages that they read, their written words we linger o'er, but in the sunlight they cast no shade, no voice is heard, no sign is made, no step is on the conscious floor. Yet love will dream, and faith will trust, since he who knows our need is just, that somehow, somewhere, meet we must. Alas for him who never sees the stars shine through his cypress trees, who hopeless lays his dead away, nor looks to see the breaking day, across the mournful marbles play, who hath not learned in hours of faith the truth of, to flesh and sense unknown, that life is ever lord of death, and love can never lose its own. We sped the time with stories old, wrought puzzles out and riddles told, or stammered from our schoolbook lore the chief of Gambia's golden shore, how often since, when all the land was clay in slavery's shaping hand, as if a triumph called, I've heard, Dame Mercy Warren's rousing word. Does not the voice of reason cry, claim the first right which nature gave, from the red scourge of bondage fly, nor deign to live a burdened slave? Our father rode again his ride on Mimfram Magog's wooded side, and down again to moose and stamp and trapper's hut and Indian camp lived o'er the old idyllic ease beneath St. Francois hemlock trees. Again for him the moonlight shone on Norman cap and bodice zone. Again he heard the violin play, which led the village dance away, and mingled in its merry whirl the grand dam and the laughing girl. 
or nearer home our steps he led, where Salisbury's level marshes spread, mile wide as flies the leaden bee, where merry mowers, hale and strong, swept sky on sky their swaths along the low green prairies of the sea. We shared the fishing off Boar's Head, and round the rocky isle of shoals, the hail broil on the driftwood coals, the chowder on the sand beach made, dipped by the hungry steaming hot with spoons of clam shell from the pot. We heard the tales of witchcraft old, and dream, and sign, and marvel told to sleepy listeners as they lay, stretched idly on the salted hay. Adrift along the winding shores, when favoring breezes deign to blow, the square sail of the gundalow, and idle lay the useless oars. Our mother, while she turned her wheel, or run the new-knit stocking heel, told how the Indian hordes came down at midnight on Cochecho town, and how her own great-uncle bore his cruel scout mark to fourscore, recalling in her fitting phrase so rich and picturesque and free the common unrhymed poetry of simple life and country ways. The story of her early days, she made for us the sunset shine, a slant the tall columnar pine, the river at her father's door, its rippled moanings whispered o'er. We heard the hawks at twilight play, the boat horn on Piscataque, the loon's weird laughter far away. So well she gleaned from earth and sky the harvest of the ear and eye, we almost felt the gusty air that swept her native wood paths bare heard the far thresher's rhythmic flail, the flapping of the fisher's sail, or saw in sheltered cove and bay the duck's black squadron anchored lay, or heard the wild geese calling loud beneath the gray November cloud. Then haply with a look more grave and somberer tone, some tale she gave from painful Sewell's ancient tome, beloved in every Quaker home, of faith fire-winged by martyrdom, or Chalkley's journal, old and quaint, gentlest of skippers, rare sea saint, who when the dreary combs prevailed, and water butt and bread cask failed, and cruel hungry eyes pursued his portly presence mad for food, with dark hints muttered under breath, of casting lots for life or death, offered, if heaven withheld supplies, to be himself the sacrifice. Then suddenly, as if to save the good man from his living grave, a ripple on the water grew, a school of porpoise flashed in view. Take, eat, he said, and be content, these fishes in my stead are sent by him who gave the tangled ram to spare the child of Abraham. Our uncle, innocent of books, but rich in lore of field and brooks, the ancient teachers never dumb of nature's unhoused lyceum. In moons and tides and weather-wise he read the clouds as prophecies, and foul or fair could well divine in, by many an occult hint and sign, holding the cunning warded keys to all the woodcraft's mysteries himself to nature's heart so near, that all her voices in his ear of beast or bird had meanings clear. Like Apollonius of old, who knew the tales the sparrows told, or Hermes, who interpreted what the sage cranes of Nihilus said. A simple, guileless, childlike man, content to live where life began, strong only on his native grounds, a little world of sights and sounds, whose girdle was the parish bounds, whereof his fondly parental bride the common features magnified, as Surrey hills to mountains grew in white of Selborne's loving view. He told how teal and loon he shot, and how the eagle's eggs he got, the feats on pond and river done, the prodigies of rod and gun. Till warming with the tales he told, forgotten was the outside cold, the bitter wind unheeded blew, from ripening corn the pigeons flew, the partridge drummed to the wood, the mink went fishing down the river brink. In fields with bean or clover gay, the woodchuck, like a hermit gray, peered from the doorway of his cell, the muskrat ply, the mason's trade, and tier by tier his mud walls laid, and from the shagbark overhead the grizzled squirrel dropped his shell. Next, the dear aunt, whose smile of cheer and voice in dreams I see and hear, the sweetest woman ever fate perverse denied a household mate, who, lonely, homeless, not the less, found peace in love's unselfishness, and welcome wheresoe'er she went a calm and gracious element, whose presence seemed the sweet income and womanly atmosphere of home, called up her girlhood memories, the huskings and the applebees, the sleigh rides and the summer sails, weaving through all the poor details and homespun warp of circumstance, a golden wolf thread of romance, for well she kept her genial mood and simple faith of maidenhood. Before her still a cloud land lay, the mirage loomed across her way, 
The morning dew that dries so soon with others glistened at her noon, through years of toil and soil and care, from glossy tress to thin gray hair. All unprofane she held apart the virgin fancies of the heart. Be shamed to him of woman bore, who hath for such but thought of scorn. There too our elder sister plied her evening task to stand beside, a full rich nature free to trust, truthful and almost sternly just, impulsive, earnest, prompt to act, and make her generous thought a fact, keeping with many a light disguise the secret of self-sacrifice. O oh, heart sore tried, thou hast the best that heaven itself could give thee, rest. Rest from all bitter thoughts and things, how many a poor one's blessings went with thee beneath the low green tent whose curtain never outward swings. As one who held herself apart of all she saw and let her heart against the household bosom lean upon the motley braided mat, our youngest and our dearest sat, lifting her large, sweet, asking eyes, now bathed within the fadeless green and holy peace of paradise. O oh, looking from some heavenly hill, or from the shade of saintly palms, or silver reached of river calms, do those large eyes behold me still? With me one little year ago, the chill weight of the winter snow for months upon her grave has lain. And now, when summer south winds blow, and briar and harebell bloom again, I tread the pleasant paths we trod. I see the violet sprinkled sod whereon she leaned, too frail and weak the hillside flowers she loved to seek. Yet following me where'er I went, with dark eyes full of love's content, the birds are glad, the briar rose fills the air with sweetness, all the hills stretch green to June's unclouded sky, but still I wait with ear and eye for something gone which should be nigh, a loss of all familiar things in flower that blooms and bird that sings, and yet, dear heart, remembering thee, am I not richer than of old, safe in thy immortality? What change can reach the wealth I hold? What chance can mar the pearl and gold thy love hath left in trust with me? And while in life's late afternoon, where cool and long the shadows grow, I walk to meet the night that soon shall shape and shadow overflow. I cannot feel that thou art far, since near at need the angels are. And when the sunset gapes unbar, shall I not see thee waiting stand? And, white against the evening star, the welcoming of thy beckoning hand. Brisk wielder of the birch and rule, the master of the district school, held at the fire his favored place. Its warm glow lit a laughing face, fresh-hued and fair, where scarce appeared the uncertain prophecy of beard. He played the old and simple games our modern boyhood scarcely names, sang songs, and told us what befalls the classic Dartmouth college halls, born the wild northern hills among, from whence his yeoman father wrung by patient toil, subsistence scant, not competence, and yet not want, he early gained the power to pay his cheerful, self-reliant way. Could doff at ease his scholar's gown to peddle wares from town to town, or through the long vacations reach in lonely lowland districts teach, where all the droll experience found at strangers' hearths and boarding round, the moonlight skater's keen delight, the sleigh drive through the frosty night, the rustic party with its rough accompaniment of blind man's bluff, of whirling plate and forfeits paid, his winter task, a pastime made. Happy the snow-locked homes wherein he turned his merry violin, nor played the athlete in the barn, nor held the good dame's winding yarn, nor mirth-provoking versions told of classics, legends, rare and old, wherein the scenes of Greece and Rome had all a commonplace of home, and little seemed at best the odds twixt Yankee peddlers and old gods, where Pindus-born Araxes took the guise of any gristmill brook, and dread Olympus at his will became a huckleberry hill. A careless boy that night he seemed, but at his desk he had the look of, and air of one who wisely schemed, and hostage from the future took, in trained thought and lore of book. Large-brained, clear-eyed, of such as he shall freedom's young apostles be, who, following in war's bloody trail, shall ever lingering wrong assail. All chains from limb and spirit strike, uplift the black and white alike, Scatter before their swift advance the darkness and the ignorance, the pride, the lust, the squalid sloth, which nurtured treason's monstrous growth, made murder pastime, and the hell of prison torture possible, the cruel lie of caste refute. Old forms were cast in substitute for slavery's lash, the freeman's will, for blind routine, wise-handed skill. 
a schoolhouse plant on every hill, stretching in radiant nerve lines thence, the quick wares of intelligence, till north and south together brought shall own the same electric thought. In peace a common flag salute, and side by side in labors free and unresentful rivalry, harvest the fields wherein they fought. Another guest that winter night flashed back from lustrous eyes the light, unmarked by time, and yet not young, the honeyed music of her tongue, and words of meekness scarcely told, and nature passionate and bold. Strong, self-centered, spurning guide, its milder features dwarf beside, her unbent will's majestic pride. She sat among us at the best, a not unfeared, half-welcome guest, rebuking with her cultured phrase our homeliness of words and ways. A certain pard-like treacherous grace swayed in the lithe limbs and drooped the lash, lent the white teeth their dazzling flash, and under low brows, black with night, rayed out at times a dangerous light. The sharp heat lightnings of her face presaged ill to him who fate condemned to share her love or hate. A woman tropical, intense in thought and act, and soul and sense, she blended in like degree the vixen and the devotee, revealing with each freak or faint the temper of Petruchio's Kate, the raptures of Siena's saint. Her tapering hand and rounded waist had facile power to form a fist. The warm, dark languish of her eyes was never safe from wrath's surprise. Brows saintly calm and lips devout knew every change of scowl and pout, and the sweet voices that had notes more high and shrill for social battle cry. Since then, what old cathedral town hath missed her pilgrim staff and gown? At what convent gate has held its lock against the challenge of her knock? Through Smyrna's plague-husked thoroughfares, up sea-set Malta's rocky stairs, gray olive slopes of hills that hem the shrones and shrines Jerusalem, or startling on her desert throne the crazy queen of Lebanon, with claims fantastic as her own, her tireless feet have held their way, and still in restful bowed and gray she watches under eastern skies, with hope each day renewed and fresh, the Lord's quick coming in the flesh, whereof she dreams and prophesies. Where'er her troubled path may be, the Lord's sweet pity with her go. The outward wayward life we see, the hidden springs we may not know. Nor is it given us to discern what threads the fatal sisters spun, through what ancestral years has run the sorrow with the woman born, what forged her cruel chains of moods, what set her feet in solitudes, and held the love within her mute, what mingled madness in the blood, a lifelong discord and annoy, water of tears and oil of joy, and hid within the folded bud perversities of flower and fruit. It is not ours to separate, the tangled skein of will and fate, to show what meets and bounds should stand upon the soul's debatable land, and between choice and providence, divide the circle of events. But he who knows our frame is just, merciful and compassionate, and full of sweet assurances and hope for all the languages, that he remembereth we are dust. At last the great logs crumbling low sent out a dull and duller glow, the bull's eye watch that hung in view, tickling its weary circuit through, pointed with mutely warning sign its black hand to the hour of nine, that sign the pleasant circle broke. My uncle ceased his pipe to smoke, knocked from its bowl the refuse gray, and laid it tenderly away. Then roused himself with stately cover, the dull red brands with ashes over. And while with care our mother laid the work aside, her step she stayed at one moment, seeking to express her grateful sense of happiness, for food and shelter, warmth and health, and love's contentment more than wealth with simple wishes, not the weak vain prayers which no fulfillment seek, but such as warm the generous heart, or prompt to do with heaven its part, that none might lack that bitter night for bread and clothing, warmth and light. Within our beds a while we heard the wind that round the gables roared, with now and then a rudder shock which made our very bedsteads rock. We heard the loosened clapboards tossed, the boar nails snapping in the frost, and on us through the unplastered wall, fell the light sifted snowflakes fall. But sleep stole on, as sleep will do, when hearts are light and life is new. Faint and more faint the murmurs grew, till all the summer land of dreams they softened to the sound of streams. Low stir of leaves and dip of oars, and lapsing waves on quiet shores. 
Next morn we wakened with a shout of merry voices high and clear, and saw that the teamsters drawing near to break the drifted highways out. Down the long hillside, treading slow, we saw the half-buried oxen go, shaking the snow from heads untossed, their straining nostrils white with frost. Before our door the straggling train drew up, an added team to gain. The elders threshed, their hands a cold, passed, with a cider mug their jokes from lip to lip. The younger folks down the loose snowbanks wrestling rolled, then toiled again the cavalcade o'er windy hill through clogged ravine. The woodland paths that wound between our low, drooping pine boughs winter weighed. From every barn a team afoot, at every house a new recruit, where, drawn by nature's subtlest law, haply the watchful young men saw sweet doorway pictures of the curls and curious eyes of merry girls, lifting their hands in mock defense against the snowball's compliments, and reading in each missive tossed the charm with Eden never lost. We heard once more the sleigh bells sound, and following where the teamsters led, the wise old doctor went his round, pausing at our door to say, in the brief autocratic way, of one who, prompt at duty's call, was free to urge her claim on all, that some poor neighbor's sick a bed, at night upon our mother's aid would need. For one in generous thought and deed, what mattered in the sufferer's sight, the Quaker matron's inward light, the doctor's mail of Calvin's creed? All hearts confess the saints elect, who, twain in faith, in love agree, and melt not in an acid sect the Christian pearl of charity. So days went on, a week had passed, since the great world was heard from last. The almanac we studied o'er, read and reread our little store, of books and pamphlets scarce a score, one harmless novel mostly hid from younger eyes, a book forbid, and poetry, or good or bad, a single book was all we had, where Elwood's meek, drab, skirted muse, a stranger to the heathen dine, sang, in a somewhat nasal whine, the wars of David and the Jews. At last the floundering carrier bore a village paper to our door, lo, broadening outward as we read, to warmer zones the horizon spread, in panoramic length unrolled, we saw the marvels that it told. Before us passed the painted creeks, the daft McGregor on his raids, in dim Floridian Everglades, and up to Ghetto's winding slow road, Ypsilanti's Mayanote Greeks, a Turk's head at each saddle bow. Welcome to us, its week old news, its corner of the rustic muse, its monthly gauge of snow and rain, its record mingling in a breath, the wedding knell and dirge of death, jests, anecdote, and lovelorn tale, the latest culprit sent to jail, its hue and cry of stolen and lost, its vindu sales and goods at cost, and traveling calling loud for gain. We felt the stir of hall and street, the pulse of life that round us beat, the chill embargo of the snow was melted in the genial glow. Wide swung again our ice-locked door, and all the world was ours once more. Clasp, angel of the backward look, and folded wings of ashen gray, and voices of echoes far away, the brazen covers of thy book. The weird palimpsest, old and vast, wherein thou hidst the spectral past, where closely mingling pale and glow the characters of joy and woe, the monographs of outlived years, or smile illumined or dimmed with tears, Green hills of life that slope to death, And haunts of home whose vested trees Shade off to mournful cypresses, With the white amaraths underneath. Even while I look, I can but heed The restless sands and incessant falls, Importunate hours that hours succeed, Each clamorous with its own sharp need, And duty keeping pace with all. Shut down and clasp the heavy lids, I hear again the voice that bids the dreamer Leave his dream midway, for larger hopes and graver fears. Life greatens in these latter years, and centuries aloe flowers today. Yet, haply, in some lull of life, some truce of God which breaks its strife, the worldling's eyes shall gather dew, dreaming in throngful city ways of winter joys. His boyhood knew, and dear and early friends, the few who yet remain, shall pause to view these Flemish pictures of old days, Sit with me by the homestead's hearth, and stretch the hands of memory forth to warm them at the firewood's blaze, and thanks untraced to lips unknown shall greet me like the odors blown from unseen meadows newly mown, or lilies floating in some pond wood fringed the wayside gaze beyond. The traveler owns the grateful sense of sweetness near, he knows not whence, and pausing takes with forehead bare the benediction of the air.
that's all for this week. Thanks for watching. If you'd like, you can click on the links over here and watch some other videos or subscribe. And I'll see you next Friday with more poetry.